Damn, that's a lot of y'all. <laughs> so uh, I get this phone call about 10 days ago, like, hey, man, you know Ted is coming to Philadelphia. I'm like, yeah, I know about Ted. It's a really big deal. They're like, so you should come speak. I'm like, uh, all right. <laughs> so uh, here we are. And uh, with the theme being the city, I thought we would uh, talk directly about that. Myself, I'm not personally from a city. Uh, I was originally born in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. I was born and raised in Lakewood, New Jersey. And uh, I've always had a strange love affair with the city. Being a 70s kid from New Jersey and growing up surrounded by hip hop culture, my friends and I always gravitated towards Manhattan because that was the mecca of hip hop culture, not rap music, hip hop culture. <laughs> and uh, my early relationship with Philadelphia was school trips to the zoo, Dr. J, Declaration of Independence, uh, random things, aside from all the things that we've learned in school. Uh, I've always been a, a musical kid. I've always been uh, very into the arts. And um, through high school, played instruments, started DJing for people when I was 10 years old, played my first Sadie Hawkins dance at 11, got paid $40, <laughs> which was like a million at the time. And uh, I've always been surrounded by it. So we were always traveling back and forth to New York to go to Washington Square Park. This was this big place where everybody would come and perform. You could see Run DMC, this person, that person. It was phenomenal. But I didn't have much of a relationship with Philadelphia aside from the fact that uh, one of my best friends from grammar school named Erwin Smalls, also known as Wiz at the time, was a dancer for Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And this was during the time of the Fresh Fest. Uh, you guys may know of a, another gentleman in the music industry named Jermaine Dupri. Jermaine Dupri was dancing for Houdini at the time. So Erwin was one of my best friends. We used to drive down to Philadelphia in his, his mom's car, an hour and 15 minutes, and just sit in this rehearsal hall watching Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff figure out their routines and watching Wiz and Omar figure out their dance routines. But beyond that, in basketball, I didn't really have much of a relationship with Philadelphia. I got out of college in 92. I went to Cornell University, first person in my family to go to college. And um, <laughs> thank you. It wasn't easy. Um, I got out of there in four years on good behavior. And <laughs> uh, upon graduation, I was drafted into the United States Basketball League. Go to the United States Basketball League. I play a relatively mediocre season of semi-professional basketball. And at the end of the season, I get called to a CBA camp, which is Continental Basketball Association. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's kind of the equivalent of AAA baseball, if you will. So I go to camp, first play the game, steal a pass, drill down, dunk, hurt my shoulder. It's like, God, I felt a little weird. Next day, I wake up, and my arm felt like it was taped to my side. And out of the clear blue sky, I started getting phone calls from my guidance counselor in high school, my college guidance counselor, my high school assistant coach and head coach, my college assistant ho coach and head coach, and they're saying, hey man, you wanna keep playing basketball, God bless you. But a black man with an Ivy League degree is a loaded gun in the business world. <laughs> you could be shooting people all day. <laughs> Can't run and jump your whole life. You want to move your moms out of that little raggedy house y'all live in? We got some job offers for you. And uh, that's how I ended up in the city of Philadelphia. I uh, took a job with Procter & Gamble, doing health and beauty care retail sales, worked there for a year, hated it. Left there, figured I'd go to another job, make some more money. I might hate that a little less. Went to Abbott Laboratories from there, sold pharmaceuticals for four years, hated it. And all along, I was still nurturing my musical aspirations. So having a job, being a loaded gun that I was, had a little paper. So three to five work days a week, you could find me in Armand's Records, Sound of Germantown, Funko Mart, Suit On, Tie Undone, spending all of that gigantic paycheck on records and equipment 
and things that were going to help me take care of my craft because I say my craft being DJ and because it was my shrink when my basketball career ended. I moved to Philadelphia. I went home. I got my turntables. I got my records. I put them in my apartment every day. Right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand. Going out to the clubs in Philadelphia, checking out the Ritz, checking out the limelight. I was lucky enough to catch the tail end of that. And um, at any given time, I see Questlove and Cosmo Baker, two men carrying milk crates of records down the street to go to a store called to lay out the DJ all day long. I'm walking around in a suit and tie. I would see Jazzy Jeff, Cash Money, Lightning Rich, listen to Patty Jackson on the radio, listen to E.C. LaRock on the radio, listen to Philadelphia's first lady of hip hop on the radio, Lady B. And it really started to hit home that Philadelphia is a hell of a musical town. And there's a great deal of, of empowerment for the arts in Philadelphia. Growing up in a Baptist church myself, I was very familiar with music outside of the secular world. And I began to study Philadelphia's music history a little bit deeper. And I learned that the uh, Philadelphia Academy of Music was founded, I believe it was 1857, oldest standing opera hall in the United States of America. At the same time, the Emancipation Proclamation was enacted in 1863, which freed the slaves. And then in 1900, the Philadelphia Opera was opened. So you have this dichotomy going on where you have slave owner culture, forefather culture, and musical culture going on at the same time. In the slave quarters, we had what was called the clandestine congregation. And by clandestine congregation, what that means is that your masters would not allow you to celebrate your original religion publicly. So you would have to sneak off, find spaces when they were sleeping, when they could get away, when you could get away from them to celebrate. So you can imagine the fervor that this created amongst, amongst black people in the United States at the time. This was all we had. This was all of our area of release was the clandestine congregation. And that's where we would play our music. That's where we would praise our Lord. That's where we would exalt ourselves of, of anything that we felt was holding us down, which fundamentally was life at the time. So you have the financial elite and the forefathers in the opera, sipping tea, I don't know, whatever the hell they did at the time. <laughs> you had us in the woods eating pork chops, bacon, because that's all that was left. But we all know, familiar with the term, pressure makes diamonds. And when you look at the dichotomy and those two things coming together, you have the beginnings of Philadelphia music culture. Some of those same people who were exercising the clandestine congregation soon became the preachers and the reverends and the deacons and the choir directors and the choir band leaders of the day that sent young musicians from the church out into the secular world to take those same chops and all of that same energy that they were putting into the Lord into the rest of the world, which created an enormous piece of fabric for us to deal with. And all the time you have these two different things going on, two different things going on. And you fast forward through history and you see Chubby Checker, you see Sun Ra and his crazy ass when he was alive, <laughs> John Coltrane. We could go halt the blue eyed soul of Hall and Oates. Uh, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff and everything that they did for dance music, they changed disco. I think they were burning records in, in Yankee Stadium on a Monday and Thursday afternoon, the OJ's the Love I Lost came out and everybody's like, yo, this disco thing ain't so bad. <laughs> I like this. So, myself coming here in 1992 and meeting guys like Tybe Smith, Victor Duplay, James Poyser, who were working out of a studio in Philly International Records and just sitting in that studio and soaking down information, soaking down information. Slowly but surely, I began to realize this job thing is kind of overrated. <laughs> <laughs> These dudes are chilling. They got new clothes on. There's girls everywhere. All these important dudes, 
They hanging out. You could drink on the job. I'm good. So in 1996, I drove my company car to my boss's house. I slid a letter of resignation in his mailbox. I rang the doorbell and I bounced. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> from 1996 forward, I've been able to call myself a professional disc jockey, professional spoken word artist, and a professional writer. I pay my bills with my craft. And the reason that means anything for this talk is because I did it in this city. This city nurtured my creative muscle. This city allowed me the opportunity to see that the grass sometimes is greener. If a real job ran up on me right now, I'd stab him dead right in the face. <laughs> Swear to God. So, 1997, I opened a store with a dear friend of mine, Bobito Garcia. This was a year after walking away from my corporate shackles. I say that so well, shackles. Um, we opened a store called Footwork, and Footwork became a bit of a haven for a generation half a step behind me who was interested in hip-hop culture. Again, not just rap music, hip-hop culture being dance, graffiti, DJing, and the use of a microphone. We were able to bridge the gap between New York graffiti artists, Philadelphia graffiti artists, squash problems between groups who were rather than, I mean, one thing, let me digress for a second. One thing about hip hop culture that you have to understand is that the reason it was invented was to stop violence. Africa Bambada and Almighty Zulu Nation created hip hop as a means to stop dudes from stabbing and shooting each other for walking down the wrong street. Instead, I'm gonna out rhyme you. I'm gonna out DJ you. I'm gonna out art you. I'm gonna out dance you. These are the tenets of hip hop culture. So when I say that, know that when I bring that reference up, this is where it's coming from. So back to the point, we became a hub for that in Philadelphia. And through that, I was able to meet even more Philadelphia pioneers who had been kind of sitting on the sidelines wondering when their opportunity was gonna to come to be heard, when their opportunity was gonna to come to be seen. And thank God I can say that I was a part of that situation. So there was a moment where Jazzy Jeff and Cash Money weren't really speaking because there was this big thing in the community about who did what first and whatever. We settled that in footwork. There's an artist from Philadelphia named Steve Powers who's spoken here at TED, also known as Espo. There's an artist from New York City known as Pose Two. Both of them move from their respective cities, go to another city, become all city. When you're all city as a graffiti artist, that means that you are up on every train, you are up on every wall, you are up on every space that you could possibly be in, and in a beautifying manner. Not just vandalism, not just putting crink oil on people's windows, stuff like that. I'll see you. <laughs> so, we were able to become a community hub, and through that, through all these people coming into our space, I was able to turn my career, which was local at the time, into a national thing because there were people in California whose records we were selling that I was able to go to California and play records simply because they were excited that we were moving so many of their units in Philadelphia. And it becomes this cycle of wax on, wax off. I'm the dude, because of that Cornell thing, I'm the dude, give me a card, I'm calling you tomorrow. Yeah, remember what you said to me yesterday? You was like, yo, I should come to your city and do the, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> no, nah, I'm packed, man, let's go. <laughs> so, now, here we are in 2011 with each other talking about the city. And for me, the city of Philadelphia has been a very, very, very nurturing mother. It's allowed me the opportunity to see the remainder of the world. I've traveled damn near everywhere in the world just because of my music, and that music is in me on a deeper level because of the city of Philadelphia. I think I speak for a great deal of people. When I say that, it doesn't make me profound, it doesn't make me deep. I think that a lot of us who have built our chops in this city can say that. Thank God I did what I did in the 90s in Philadelphia, because if I did it anywhere else, I don't know if I'd be able to do it. And I travel and people say, well, what is it in the water? What is it about 
Philadelphia, you know, the, the, the music, you guys are so soulful, you play so emotional, you play from your gut all the time, everybody from whatever, hip hop, rock, house music, dance music, electronica, and you have everything from some of the people I've already mentioned to Diplo and Holotronics who basically changed music culture very much in the same way other changes have come out of Philadelphia. Diplo and Holotronics made it safe for the little white dude that likes to wear do-rags and gold fronts in his mouth. <laughs> they made that dude walk in a club and feel like, yeah, I'm supposed to be here, man. This is, I, I am the man. Like, 